Aren't you excited? I know I am, because here we are, back for part two of the Blood Vessel Lecture, and we're about to really get into it. So roll your sleeves up, put your thinking cap on, let's go. Okay, Dr. Jenkins here. In the first video for blood vessels, we talked about the structure of blood vessels, arteries, veins, capillaries, types of arteries and veins. And then we spent some time introducing some principles of blood flow and pressure. I wanna do a quick review because that information is gonna be helpful when we start talking about regulation of blood flow and blood pressure. You may remember, and notice, the more often I review things, it's like a little message I'm sending right to you. Study, study. If I keep going over it, it's going to be on the test, going to be on the test. So we talked about blood flow being proportionate to change in pressure over resistance. So if we draw that out, when we have high flow, there's a high change in pressure. Those are directly related. But then flow and resistance are inversely related. So when one is high, the other is low. Then we talked about blood pressure being equal to cardiac output times peripheral resistance. And these are always directly related. So that means that when blood pressure is high, cardiac output is high. When blood pressure is high, peripheral resistance is high. I encourage you to think about when it comes to exam time, writing these out on the side of the exam or on a blank sheet of paper so you can refer to them. When we look at it in total, the tricky part, I think, comes with resistance. Because in one equation, resistance is inversely related to what we're talking about. And in the other, it's directly related. So when it comes to resistance, when there is high resistance, we have a high blood pressure, but a low flow. Right, that should be resistance, sorry about that. And then when we have low resistance, low resistance means we have low blood pressure, but high flow. And then all along, I talked about the examples of the garden hose, okay? All right, so now let's put it all into practice. Here we go. So we're going to talk about this three ways. So we're going to end up talking about regulation of blood pressure and blood flow through autoregulation, number one. We're gonna talk about how we regulate blood pressure and flow through neural control, and that should be a two. And then we're also gonna talk about how we regulate blood pressure and flow through hormones. So we've got three different things working together to regulate blood pressure and blood flow. As I said before, this is critical. The blood flow is our lifeline. So we have to, have to be able to send blood to where it's needed at the right time in a myriad of situations. And that is a tough job. So that's why we have many, many ways in which we can regulate it to make sure that we're delivering blood at the right flow, at the right pressure to where it's needed at every given moment. We can also divide these three mechanisms up into short-term and long-term. The first two ways are local control and our neurons, our nervous system control. Well, these are short-term regulators. And then the hormones are our long-term regulators. And I think this makes sense. The nervous system acts very quickly. It's a short-term regulator. Hormones take longer, right? We've got to We've got to release the hormones from a gland. Those hormones have to travel through the bloodstream. Then they've got to get to the tissue. The hormones have to interact with the plasma membrane of the tissue to get in. It takes longer. So it's no surprise that our nervous system is more of a short-term regulator and the hormones are long-term. And of course, 
The autoregulation with the vasoconstriction and vasodilation is short term also. So let's take these one by one. We're going to start with local regulation. Now, this is primarily a means of regulating blood flow. Now, it can get a little tricky, so that's why I'm trying to really make sure that we're starting our conversation of each from the right place. All three of them together, as you can see by this title, we're talking about regulating blood pressure and blood flow. Well, it just so happens that the local regulation, even though it does affect pressure, our discussion is going to be framed mostly around how local regulation can alter blood flow. And this, my friends, please don't overthink it. What we're talking about is simply the ability of the arterioles to vasoconstrict and vasodilate to alter the amount of blood flow to an organ. That is it. It does relate to pressure at that area, but it has less of effect of our overall systemic blood pressure. So that's why I'm focusing on blood flow. So folks, it's pretty simple. It's what I said before. We're just giving it a fancy name. At local areas all over our body, the arterioles that feed into the capillaries are constantly making decisions on whether to dilate or constrict. Any time that we want to increase flow to an organ, we will do what? Vasodilate the arterioles that lead into the capillaries of that organ. On the other hand, any time we don't need as much blood flow to an organ, we vasoconstrict. Just think of the garden hose. If I need more water to come out, I dilate. Make the opening large. If I don't need as much flow to an area, then I can constrict the opening. The example I gave to you was with exercise. That's an easy example. Remember, it's not like we completely stop blood flow to an area. Every area of our body needs blood flow all the time, but we can constantly alter the amount because we only have a certain volume of blood, remember four to six liters in an average adult, and we have to be able to deliver that blood to where it's most needed. So during exercise, for example, the arterioles going into the skeletal muscles that are working will dilate. But at the same time during exercise, the arterioles to our gut, our GI organs, the arterioles to our kidney will constrict a little. So we'll still be delivering some blood to our GI tract and kidneys, but not as much because we need to give more blood to the muscles and it has to come from somewhere. This is it. Please do not overthink it. There are some other chemicals that are involved but I'm not going to ask you those. So, of course, there's more involved. There's more complexity to the minutia of it. But on its face, very simply, we constrict or dilate the arterioles into an area to either increase or decrease the blood flow to that area. And that is it, my friends. You know, I may have given this example in the first video. I'm trying to think. If we think about our blood vessels like pipes, because they are like pipes, the same fluid dynamics that govern how water moves through the pipes of a house are the same fluid dynamics that govern blood moving through our blood vessels. If we think of the main sewer line, in this case, it would be from like a town or city line, as the heart. So always, 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 there's going to be a constant flow of water in. Just like with our heart. Our heart is always going to be pumping out a certain volume of blood. At rest, at rest, we're pumping out maybe four to six liters of blood. But then 
what we do with that volume changes. If I am washing dishes, maybe I send more water. Please ignore that again. If I'm washing dishes, maybe I send more water to the kitchen and less water goes up to the shower. There's still water going through all the pipes to a certain degree, but I just redirect some of it to where I need it most. And it's the same idea in the body. There's always going to be some blood going everywhere, but we can redirect more blood to where we need it more at a given time. Maybe that helps you, maybe it doesn't. I'm just trying to give you different means of trying to understand it. Okay, when it comes to the nervous system, so this is actually number two, autocorrect played some tricks on me. A second way that we can regulate blood pressure and blood flow is through the nervous system. And of course, part of that is going to involve the sympathetic nervous system. So, you know, I could take this discussion in a lot of different ways. I'm choosing to talk about a couple specific autonomic reflexes. Because I think that's a really, even though it's a little bit more complex, it's a very clear example of how the autonomic nervous system works. Which, by the way, I mean, the sympathetic nervous system is part of the autonomic overall nervous system. So we're going to focus on a couple of reflexes. I'm going to ask you to know these two. How the nervous system may respond to the need to change blood pressure and blood flow through baroreceptors and through chemoreceptors. So here we have an example of negative feedback, right? Because that's how the nervous system really works. That's how the endocrine system works too. Something in the body senses a change. Then the body processes that change, whether it's the brain or a gland. And then the body does something to correct that change. If temperature is too high, the body does something to bring temperature down. If you don't have enough oxygen to an area, then the body does something to bring the oxygen levels back up to that area. So it's negative feedback. This, these examples just happen to be examples of negative feedback that alter cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Now, here, we're going to be focusing more on blood pressure. So if you remember, when we were talking about autoregulation, I was focusing more on blood flow. So of course, all these things work together, but for ease of understanding and when you're studying, my suggestion is that you study these separately. So in one little file in your brain, you study, okay, autoregulation. This is a short-term way that we can regulate blood flow. We can alter blood flow by constricting or dilating the arterioles. Boom. If I need more blood flow, an arterial vasodilates. If I need less blood flow, an arterial vasoconstricts. Done. In a separate file in your brain, we're going to talk about another way we can regulate, but this time we're talking about the autonomic reflexes of the nervous system helping to regulate blood pressure. So here we're talking about how the autonomic nervous system can help to regulate blood pressure. And we're going to go back to our blood pressure equation. Do you remember? Blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times peripheral resistance. So in these reflexes, it's a negative feedback loop to maintain blood pressure by altering either cardiac output and or peripheral resistance. These are, of course, short term. These are ways in which we can generally talk about the sympathetic nervous system. But as I said, I'm making the choice to not talk about that because I want to instead give you some specific examples that I think are a little bit clearer. So I'd like you to know our examples that we're going to talk about of barrow reflexes to regulate blood pressure and chemoreceptor reflexes to regulate blood pressure. 
in order to maintain blood pressure. Of course, the only ways that we're going to be able to really alter it are by altering cardiac output and or peripheral resistance. Let's give some examples. Okay. Boy, do I love physiology. Remember I said how there would be more physiology in A&P too? Well, we've already gotten there. We talked about blood clotting in the first chapter. We talked about the cardiac induction system. We talked about the cardiac cycle in the second chapter, physiology. And now we're talking about these baroreceptor and chemoreceptor reflexes and blood pressure regulation. Woo! Gets me excited. All right, so when we talk about baroreceptor reflexes, baro means pressure. So this tells us right away that we're helping to regulate blood pressure by relying on these baroreceptors. So these little yellow doodads are trying to represent baroreceptors. These are specialized nerve endings that are sensitive to changes in pressure. Okay, so these are specialized receptors, as the name suggests, baroreceptor. They're specialized receptors that sense changes in pressure. We have these specialized receptors that sense changes in pressure in the walls of our carotid arteries, in the walls of our ascending aorta, and in the walls of our right atrium. You don't have to know these specifically, I just wanted to give you some examples. But doesn't it make sense that these are all locations in and around the heart? We're going right to the source, right to the heart of the beast to, rate, to sense pressure. We can get a lot of information about how much blood is coming out and the pressure of the blood coming out of the heart by putting our sensors right in and around the heart. Okay, so we have these baroreceptors located in and around the heart, and they are, of course, sensitive to pressure. Let's give an example. And I'm putting this this way with certain things in red because that's how I'm encouraging you to study it. And that also means that that's how I'm going to ask you the questions on a test, right? If you memorize one way, so if I memorize what happens in this receptor negative feedback loop when blood pressure increases, then I automatically know what's going to happen when blood pressure decreases because it would just be the opposite. So you don't really have to study both. Just memorize one. So here we go. This is what homeostasis would look like, but of course, things are always going to be moving a bit from homeostasis. So here we have an example. Sorry about that. Here we have an example when blood pressure abnormally rises. And we're talking about abnormally rises. We're not talking about like during exercise when it should go up. When blood pressure should go up, for example, during exercise, these receptors will still sense that. But then when the message goes to the brain, the brain will be like, oh, yeah, I know, baroreceptor, I know the pressure's gone up, but it's okay because we're exercising. But if the blood pressure goes up at a time when it doesn't need to, then when that baroreceptor communicates to the brain, the brain now is going to say, oh yeah, blood pressure isn't supposed to be up right now. Let's fix it. So negative feedback loop. We have an abnormal increase in blood pressure. That baroreceptor senses that abnormal increase in blood pressure and tells the brain about it. So what is the body going to do to bring blood pressure back down to normal? Well, to bring blood pressure back down to normal, the brain is going to trigger a dilation of the arterioles. Now, this is different because we were previously talking about blood flow with vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Now we're talking about pressure. So if I have a problem where there's too much blood pressure, in order to fix that, in order to lower blood pressure, we dilate the blood vessels. Because remember, when a vessel is dilated, there's less pressure. Think about the garden hose. If the opening at the end of the garden hose is dilated, is fully open, 
the water comes out at a lower pressure versus if I constrict the end of that garden hose, the pressure goes up, right? Now, of course, the brain's going to signal many other things to happen, but I'm just giving you one example. So here we have a baroreceptor reflex as a way that the nervous system can help maintain blood pressure. If blood pressure goes up abnormally, the baroreceptors will sense that increase in blood pressure, send a message to the brain, and in an effort to lower blood pressure back to normal, the brain will trigger vasodilation of arterioles. Because when we dilate the arterioles, blood, uh, blood pressure goes back down. If you can memorize that, folks, then the opposite is true. If we have an abnormal decrease in blood pressure, like when there's severe bleeding, then we're going to have a constriction of blood vessels which means it will increase blood, blood pressure, bring it back up to normal. There's other things on this slide, but you only have to know what I just talked about. Pretty cool, isn't it? Now I skipped a slide. Here's some good information, but you don't have to know it for the test. We're going to go to our second example of how the nervous system can help to regulate blood pressure by talking about the chemoreceptor reflexes. So as the name suggests, before we had baroreceptor, and baro means pressure. So those were receptors that are sensitive changes in pressure. Here we have chemoreceptors. This means that these are receptors that are sensitive to changes in blood chemistry. And we're talking about mostly blood gases. So here we have receptors located in some of the same spots as we saw the baroreceptors in and around the heart, but instead of being responsive to changes in pressure, they are responsive to changes in gas levels. And of course, that also relates to pH. We're gonna focus on the gas levels. Oh, and pH, you know, I got a little carried away here. So we're talking about gas levels and pH. That's right. So we're talking about both. Now, this picture is set up a little bit differently than the other one. Homeostasis here is at the bottom, okay? So again, we're just gonna go through one example, and if you can memorize this one example, then you'll be able to know the other because it'll just be the opposite. So what happens when we have a drop in pH? So here we have a normal pH, And we have normal oxygen and CO2 levels. We like that. We like in the bloodstream when the pH is where it should be, between 7.35 and 7.45. And that means that we're having normal oxygen and CO2 levels. But of course, things change in the body. So what if we have an increase in CO2 levels? And of course, we know that when we have an increase in CO2 levels, that will very quickly drop the pH. So instead of being normal, we have a situation where there's an elevation in CO2, which causes the blood pH to rise. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> so the chemoreceptors will sense that. The specialized receptors will sense, oh my God, pH is too low. Oh my God, too much CO2. So what are they going to do? What is the body going to do to bring the pH back up to normal? So when the pH drops because of increased CO2 levels, in a negative feedback loop, in order to bring the pH back up to normal and lower the CO2 levels, the body is going to increase cardiac output and do vasoconstriction. Let's play this out with why this works. So our initial problem is too much carbon dioxide, which lowers the pH. In order to fix that, we're going to increase cardiac output and increase blood pressure. Because by the way, when we vasoconstrict, what does that do? 
increases the blood pressure. The idea here is when I increase cardiac output and increase blood pressure, blood pressure, I can send more blood to the lungs, which means I can breathe out more CO2. The only way to get rid of more CO2 is to send more blood to the lungs. In order to send more blood to the lungs, I've got to increase how much blood I pump out, and I've got to increase the pressure with which the blood moves through those vessels. It's almost the same reaction you have when you exercise. Just imagine when you exercise, your heart pumps out more blood, the pressure of that blood moving through the vessels goes up, and you increase respiratory rate. Anytime you have more blood going to the lungs, the lungs are going to follow suit. So by increasing the blood flow to the lungs, that means I can breathe out more CO2. When I therefore lower my CO2 levels, that brings my pH back to normal. Isn't our body so smart? I think it is. Except my body's not very smart because it keeps having me blow my nose when I'm trying to lecture. All right, so feel free to go over this video many, many times. These are the examples I'd like you to know. I'd like you to know what the receptor is sensing and what's going to happen to fix that initial problem. This is a reflex that I'm not asking you to know. It, of course, does exist, but we're only gonna, I'm only going to ask you to know the baroreceptor and chemoreceptor reflexes. All right, you're still with me, ladies and gentlemen. Big, deep breath. So we talked about how we can regulate blood flow in the short term through either vasoconstricting or vasodilating arterioles that lead into areas. Then we talked about how we can regulate blood pressure in the short term through the autonomic nervous system reflexes. Now we're switching gears to long term. You know, we have to have, and we're going to see this over and over again when we talk about these body systems in AMP2. We have a short term fix, usually the nervous system, and that enables us to handle things in the short term. But in some ways, it's just a band aid, and we also need a long term response to handle things over the long term with a little bit more permanence. And usually, almost always, our long-term response involves hormones. The short-term response is going to be utilizing most often the nervous system because, as I said, nerve, impu nerve impulses are quick. But we also have to have a long-term means of regulation. And that almost always involves hormones of the endocrine system, which, of course, take longer but can be much, much more effective overall. So it's no different here. When we talk about long-term regulation of blood pressure, and here again, we're going to be focusing on blood pressure. In the autoregulation, we focused on flow, but for the second two, the nervous system and the endocrine system, we're focusing more on how we regulate blood pressure. Our ability to regulate blood pressure in the long term has everything to do with blood volume. This is really important. The body's ability to regulate blood pressure long term is all about blood volume. Because when our blood volume is high, when we have a nice healthy six liters of blood going through our tubes, our blood vessels, when blood volume is high, then the blood pressure is high. If you put more fluid in the tubes, there'll be more pressure, right? If I just simply have more blood in the vessels, there's gonna be more pressure because there's more fluid to exert pressure against the vessel walls. And then on the other hand, any time that blood volume goes down, think about dehydration. Think about severe bleeding. 
when someone is dehydrated, their blood pressure goes down. When someone loses a lot of blood volume, their blood pressure goes down. Simply because you have less fluid in the pipes, less fluid in the vessels. If there's not as much fluid, then there can't be as much pressure of the fluid against the vessel walls. So how is it that hormones regulate blood pressure? By influencing blood volume. So these hormones, as we're going to find out, will influence blood volume. And by influencing blood volume, it will therefore influence blood pressure. And this is really, really important. We're going to talk about two ways that this happens. I'm going to talk about what I call a more direct mechanism and then a more indirect. And they're both renal, which tells us, boom, 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 hormones. Let me keep it very simple when I talk about a direct renal mechanism. One way that the kidneys can alter blood volume, one way that kidneys, one way that the kidneys can alter blood volume is by changing how quickly they filter blood. Let me walk you through an example. If we have a problem where blood pressure is too low, so if blood pressure is too low, one thing the kidneys can do to fix it Kidneys slow down the kidneys will slow their filtration. In other words, by slowing filtration, they retain more and you pee out less. Stick with me here. If our blood pressure is too low, that's a problem. Well, our kidneys just slow down. The kidneys just slow down. And that means that more fluid is retained and you lose less fluid through urine. Because when the kidneys are working hard, when they're filtering hard, they're going to produce a lot of urine. They're filtering the blood, filtering the blood, producing urine, producing urine. Well, if my initial problem is having a drop of blood pressure, which in other words means a drop in blood volume, the kidneys just slow down. And when the kidneys slow down, they retain more water because they're not peeing out as much. And the result is increased blood volume. Because if I am not peeing out as much, I'm keeping more fluid in the body, which increases blood volume. And anytime we increase blood volume, we increase blood pressure. So that is it in a relatively simple nutshell. And the other would be true. On the other hand, what if blood pressure is too high? If blood pressure is too high then we could also assume that blood volume is too high. Or we could say if blood pressure is too high, one way to lower blood pressure is to lower blood volume. So if blood pressure is too high, then your kidneys will work harder, which means they'll filter more and you'll pee out more. So you'll lose blood volume. And if I lose blood volume, the blood pressure goes down. I mean, I think you know this example because you've experienced it. If you have been drinking a lot of water or any other fluid, if you drink a lot, you get a higher blood volume. So your kidneys start working harder. And guess what? You pee out more. Versus, on the other hand, if you haven't had anything to drink for a while or if you're dehydrated, it's summertime, you're outside working for exercising or whatever. If you're dehydrated, you, you just don't pee as much because your kidneys are trying to conserve water. Here we're saying that the ability of the kidneys to filter more or less, to produce more or less urine, also influences the pressure. 
And one of our most powerful long-term blood pressure regulators is our kidneys. Yeah, everyone knows about the kidneys. They filter blood, blah, blah, blah. That's great. But here is a function of the kidneys that's just as important. They help to regulate blood pressure by influencing blood volume over the long term. Wow. I tell you what, so good. All right, so we're going to talk about the indirect mechanism, which is all about the renin-angiotensin mechanism. I'm excited. Here's a picture. Um, for some reason, they didn't include this in the newer versions of the Merriam textbook. It's in an older one, and when I copied it, it kind of came out a little grainy, as you can see. If you're visual, you might like this because it actually does a decent job. So what we just talked about was the direct renal mechanism. And I gave you an example. If our blood pressure goes down, so this is saying if blood pressure goes down. If blood pressure goes down, we're also saying potentially that there's a low blood volume. So how is the kidney going to respond? Well, to fix that, the kidneys will slow filtration. That's what that's trying to say. If our initial problem is a drop in blood pressure, which could also be associated with a drop in blood volume, the kidneys will attempt to fix that negative feedback by decreasing filtration. When the kidneys filter less, there's less urine lost. So if I'm not peeing out as much, I retain more water because I'm not peeing it out. And if I retain more water, blood volume goes up. And if blood volume goes up, blood pressure goes up. Now we're going to talk about the indirect mechanism, which is called the renin-angiotensin mechanism. Here they're being all fancy, and they call it the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. We're just going to say renin-angiotensin. Let me lay this out for you, and I think it'll make the most sense this way. So here's our initial situation. We have an abnormal drop in blood pressure. Now, this mechanism is only active when blood pressure drops. The direct renin mechanism, the direct renin mechanism can work both ways. Here I've given you an example of what it would do if blood pressure drops, but I could also say, well, what if blood pressure is too high? then the opposite would happen. The kidneys would increase the filtration, so you pee more. But on the indirect side, it's really only going to be active when blood pressure drops. And by the way, when it drops a pretty significant amount, a small drop in blood pressure is unlikely to trigger this entire mechanism. So when the blood pressure is abnormally low and low by a pretty significant amount. Your kidneys release a hormone called renin, hence the name renin-angiotensin mechanism. Renin, the release of renin, then leads to a bunch of other things that happen. So when renin is released, it causes a release of angiotensin 1, some chemical angiotensin 1, and then angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is the magic potion because angiotensin 2 does four different things all designed to increase blood pressure back to normal. This is why this is such a powerful mechanism. Even though it takes longer, because we have to release the hormone, renin. It's got to go through a couple of chemical steps. It's got to form angiotensin 1, which then has to be converted to angiotensin 2, 
But then once we get there, angiotensin II does four things to bring blood pressure back up to normal. Let's look at each of these four things. Remember, our problem was a drop in blood pressure. This was our problem. No. So all four of these things are going to fix the problem by increasing blood pressure. Well, how can we increase blood pressure? We can release a hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone, we could simplify by calling it our salt-retaining hormone. Because aldosterone goes to the kidneys, tells them to retain more salt. Instead of peeing it out, keep it. By retaining more salt, we retain more water. Because water follows salt. So by retaining more water, we increase blood volume, which increases blood pressure. Not only does angiotensin II lead to a release of aldosterone, which comes from the adrenal gland, which is on top of the kidney, we also, from angiotensin II, see a release of antidiuretic hormone. Let me write it so you can actually see it there. Apologize for that. Right? ADH, anti diuretic hormone, to where it gets its name, ADH. We can think of ADH as our water-retaining hormone. This hormone is released from the pituitary gland, but it acts on the kidney. So here we have another way to retain water. The kidneys don't pee out as much, and we retain water. By increasing blood volume, we can increase blood pressure. Very powerful, but indeed takes longer. And I mean longer over a couple of hours for this to really have a significant effect on blood volume and blood pressure. Aldosterone too also makes us thirsty. It stimulates the thirst center in our hypothalamus. So if I'm thirsty, I drink more. If I bring in more fluid by drinking, I increase blood volume, which increases blood pressure. And lastly... Angiotensin II leads to widespread vasoconstriction. Because what does vasoconstriction do to pressure? Increases it. So by vasoconstricting many, many peripheral arterioles, it has the effect of increasing overall blood pressure. This is pretty cool, folks. And this shows you the same exact thing, right? If we have a drop in blood pressure, this is actually a clearer picture. Among other things, so I'm not going to talk about that now, but among other things, a significant drop in blood pressure causes the kidneys to release a hormone called renin. Renin leads to a series of chemical reactions of which we form angiotensin II. That's the key. Because angiotensin II does four things to increase blood pressure back to normal. It causes a release of aldosterone, our salt-retaining hormone. Aldosterone goes to our kidneys, telling them to retain more salt. If I retain more salt, I also retain more water. By retaining more water, blood volume goes up, which increases blood pressure. Angiotensin II also causes a release of ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, which goes to our kidneys and tells them to absorb more water, retain more water. By retaining more water... My blood volume goes up, which increases my blood pressure. Thirdly, angiotensin II stimulates our thirst center in our brain, makes us thirsty. If I bring more fluid in by drinking it, I increase blood volume, which increases blood pressure. And lastly, angiotensin II causes widespread vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction leads to an increase in pressure. So all of these things increase the blood pressure back to normal. Pretty fantastic. I love it, my people. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, I'm going to make another point here, but you do not have to know it for the test. If you see here, there's something called angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. Again, this is not going to be on the test. There's a class of medications 
called ACE inhibitors. These are usually used to treat high blood pressure. So here we're seeing where the ACE inhibitor works. If someone has high, chronically high blood pressure, we fix that by lowering blood pressure. So if we can deliver a medication that inhibits this enzyme, if we inhibit the angiotensin converting enzyme, if we inhibit what usually converts angiotensin one to angiotensin two, we inhibit that. That means we don't have as much angiotensin two. And if I don't have as much angiotensin two, I don't have as many things to increase blood pressure. So the result is a drop in blood pressure. Therefore, helpful to someone with high blood pressure. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, another quick point before we get to some of our last topics. Um, I've already talked about this. I just want to make sure that we have a slide to make sure that you study it. We've already talked about the fact that we constrict and dilate the arterioles to various parts of our body in response to the needs. If somebody is a couch potato, I know for me during this COVID time, I've been sitting on my butt a lot. I really miss, I really miss getting up and walking around and the classroom and all that. So maybe I'm more of a couch potato. Well, when I'm sitting down recording this lecture, sitting on my butt, then the arterioles to my legs will constrict because I'm not, I'm not using my legs. I'm not exercising, they're just sitting there. So while some blood flow is still going to the muscles of my legs, not as much as needed. It is when we're at rest, however, that we can dilate the blood flow to our intestines and our kidneys. I'm not needing to use blood for exercise for those muscles, so now my body can afford to send more blood flow to my kidneys and GI tract. On the other hand, if I'm exercising, and by the way, I do exercise five days a week on my bike in the basement on the trainer, have an hour and a half ride to do after I finish this. Well, when I'm exercising, now I'm gonna increase my blood flow to the legs by dilating those arterioles. And while I'm exercising, we just constrict some of the blood flow to the intestines and the kidneys. While there's still some blood flow going to my intestines and kidneys, not as much, because during that time, I need more blood flow to my legs. So be able to know these two examples. I think they're a very simple example of how our blood distribution will change. Here is an example by percentage. And I just want to do this to show you how much we can redis redis redistribute blood. Couldn't get that word out, how much we redistribute blood. Look, look at at rest. At rest, even though it's, you know, five liters of blood, look at how much is going to my kidneys. Look at how much is going to my digestive tract. Over 20% is going to my kidneys and then another 20% plus going to my digestive tract. But look at how that changes when I'm exercising. I only have 3%. So we really have a good ability to do this. And that means while at rest, it's still a significant amount because you, you have over 600 skeletal muscles. At rest, maybe only 20% of the blood is going to my muscles. When I exercise, we can increase that to 71%. So our body is seriously good at this. And thankfully it is. I'm not going to ask you the exact percentages, but I'm giving, you this, I'm giving you this as an example to show the degree to which we're able to do this. Okay. We have two more topics to talk about. One of them is capillary exchange. And then we'll talk a little bit about how blood moves through the veins, venous return. So here we've gone through this whole chapter. We've talked about what arteries and veins are structured like. We've talked about how the body regulates blood pressure, which is mostly related to arteries. But what about the capillaries? I mean, the whole point, the whole point of our entire cardiovascular system. What's the whole point? Pump out blood so we can deliver things to the tissues. 
Our cells are working little factories and they need constantly supplies, oxygen, glucose, amino acids. They need supplies. So we send the blood to an area, but we haven't yet talked about how we actually get those supplies from the capillaries into the tissue. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this. Okay, so first, let's talk about what's being exchanged in what direction. So here we have blood coming down from the arteries into the arterioles. We know that the arterioles will lead into the capillary bed. So even though we don't show you the full capillary bed layout, just because we want to be able to see some of the other information, indeed, the capillary bed would be all between those brackets. And of course, whatever is left will leave through a vein going back to the heart. This is a simple circulatory route. Well, what's going where? Well, we can simply talk about oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen, we're going to move from the capillary into the tissues. That's the whole point. We're dropping off. We're moving oxygen from the blood into the tissues. That's why venous blood is shown as blue. It's deoxygenated because the oxygen was just dropped off. In the capillary bed, not only is it important to drop off needed nutrients, including oxygen, glucose, and so forth, the capillaries are also an important part of picking up waste products. So the best example of that is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide that's built up in the tissues moves back into the veins. And then the veins will take it back to the heart. The heart takes it to the lungs and then we're able to breathe out the CO2 to permanently get rid of it. We already know that the opening and closing of blood flow moving through the capillaries and into the tissues is regulated by those precapillary sphincters, the little Kong-shaped dog toy thing over top where the arterial meets the capillary. So I've already talked about this. This is why we have blood vessels, blah, blah, blah. So how do we do it? So we've just said, well, easy. Oxygen moves from the capillaries into the tissues. That's easy. CO2 moves from the tissues into the veins. How? What is the process? You know what, folks? Diffusion. <laughs> if you wondered why your AMP instructor went on and on about diffusion, why you had a lab about diffusion, it's because it happens everywhere. Here we see a cross section of a capillary where we have oxygen moving from inside the capillary to the tissues outside the capillary, and where CO2 moves from the tissues into the capillary. Gases can move through simple diffusion. They, they can dissolve right through the membrane because they're small enough and the pores in the capillaries are small enough. Right? Through the membrane of the capillary. But what about glucose? Glucose is a little bit bigger. Look at this green guy. That's glucose. Well, glucose is too big to fit directly through the capillary membrane. So instead, it is more likely to diffuse in or out through a pore or a channel. Okay, so larger structures, it's still diffusion because there's still more on one side versus the other, but channels are needed for glucose because it's a little bit bigger. Whereas the smallest particles, the gases, can diffuse right through the membrane of the capillary wall. The biggest particles, so we started with the smallest. Gases can move right through the membrane. The next biggest, glucose, needs a pore. But the biggest of the big, for example, hormones, They've got to move through a vesicle. 
I'm not going to ask you about pinocytosis right now, but we're just seeing it's a vesicle. And we talked about vesicular transport in AMP1. We talked about endocytosis and exocytosis. So hormones, because they're the biggest, they require a little vesicle to transport it into and out of the capillary. So we're utilizing diffusion through simple diffusion and with a diffusion that is facilitated by a channel. And we're also utilizing vesicular transport, which actually requires ATP. It is a form of active transport. And an example of what would diffuse into, excuse me, an example of what would move into and out of the capillary through a vesicle would be a hormone. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could end it there? But no, 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 we can't. Because it's not only movement of gases, nutrients like glucose and hormones that we have to talk about. In addition to solutes moving into and out of the capillary, we also have a movement of fluid. And that is really just as important. We'll get to this when we talk about the fluid balance chapter later this semester. It's important that we regulate our fluid, and some of our fluid is in the blood vessels. Some of our fluid is between cells and the tissues, and some of our fluid is inside of the cells. It's intracellular. As a matter of fact, two-thirds of our fluid is inside of the cells. Isn't that crazy? We have more fluid inside of our cells than we do in our bloodstream because these cells are working factories. They need a lot of fluid. So it's important that we recognize that there's fluid in other places and we talk about fluid movement. So when we talk about capillary exchange, therefore, it's not just that we have to talk about gases and nutrients and hormones that are exchanged into and out of the capillary. We also have to talk about movement of fluid into and out of the blood vessels, which happens here at the capillaries. Movement of fluid is occurring because of an opposing forces. This is different. The movement of the solutes that we just talked about, the movement of solutes into and out of the capillary occurs through diffusion or active transport through a vesicle. But this fluid, it's not so much happening because of diffusion. Any movement of fluid into or out of the capillaries and bloodstream is occurring because of these forces. Let's talk about these forces. And by the way, we're going to see these forces again. We're going to see them when we talk about the respiratory system, when we talk about the renal system. So this is a principle that we're going to go over again. Bear with me. We have two opposing forces on either side of the capillary. There is a hydrostatic pressure and what we call an osmotic pressure, or sometimes called colloid pressure. I'm going to use this diagram, but you can also refer back to this for the definition in words. Here is our same arterial feeding blood into the capillaries. Between here are the capillaries. It's, they're not drawn out there, but the capillary bed is there. And whatever is left in the capillaries moves into the veins to go back up to the heart. Well, in addition to the movement of oxygen, carbon dioxide, glucose, hormones into and out of the capillary, there's also a movement of fluid. This blue pressure, let me, I'll use the same colors. This blue is representing hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure drives fluid out of the capillary. And that's what this arrow is showing you. So hydrostatic pressure moves fluid out of the capillaries into the tissue. The way that I remember hydrostatic pressure, because it moves fluid out of the capillary, to me, it's a continuation of blood pressure. 
Think about the arteries and the arterioles. What is the direction? What is the direction of the blood moving through it? Well, the pressure comes in this way. A continuation of that is that it goes out. And indeed, when systemic blood pressure is higher, then our hydrostatic pressure is higher. So if we have more pressure of fluid coming into the arterial and capillary, there's going to be more pressure of fluid going out. So hydrostatic pressure drives fluid out of the capillary and into the tissue. On the other hand, we have osmotic pressure. Now, technically, osmotic and colloid can be separated, and we'll talk about that separation when we get to the kidneys. But we're going to, just for now, we're just going to call it osmotic. Well, if hydrostatic pressure moves fluid out of the capillaries into the tissue, it stands to reason that osmotic pressure drives fluid from the tissues into the capillaries. Osmotic pressure drives fluid into the capillaries. We can see how these are opposing pressures or opposing forces. Now, if we were to draw a line that divides the capillary bed in half, on the half of the capillary bed that's closer to the arteriole, we're going to see more hydrostatic pressure. Right? So on the side that's closer to the arteriole, there's more hydrostatic pressure because we're closer to the blood pressure that the blood came in with. On the side that's closer to the vein, we're going to see a greater osmotic pressure. So if we were to take the capillary bed as a whole, there's both. There's some hydrostatic pressure driving fluid out of the capillary into the tissues, and there's some osmotic pressure driving fluid from the tissues back into the capillary. There's a little bit of a difference. If we're on the capillary bed more towards the arterial side, there's going to be more filtration, but there will still be some osmotic pressure. And likewise, on the side that's closer to the vein, we're going to have mostly osmotic pressure, but of course there will be some filtration. When we take all the forces combined, we will find a net, a net filtration pressure. So if we were to combine all the if we were to combine all of the hydrostatic pressures and all of the osmotic pressures and we were to look at the balance, that balance is the net filtration pressure. Overall, in a normal situation, even though sometimes we have to tip the scales in one direction or the other, but overall, we're going to see a little bit more hydrostatic pressure compared to osmotic. Okay? Overall, even though there's more osmotic on one side compared to the other, but if we look at the whole, the net filtration pressure, overall we should see a little bit more hydrostatic, and that's good because it keeps fluid going in this direction. A little bit more than fluid that's being reabsorbed. Now, if I go back, sometimes you'll see these terms. The, hydra the hydrostatic pressure that drives fluid out of the capillaries into the tissues is sometimes referred to as a filtration pressure versus the osmotic pressure which forces fluid from the tissues back into the capillaries. That can be sometimes referred to as a reabsorption pressure. I'm going to stick more to hydrostatic and osmotic, just for ease of understanding. I mean, so we've really covered it all. We've talked about how we move gases, nutrients, hormones. We've talked about how we move fluid into and out of the capillary and tissues. We've talked about what the net filtration pressure should be. 
fantastic, my friends. Um, don't need to worry about this. We're going to skip that. Okay. Our last topic. Are you ready? You're putting in a lot of good work here. Really, the only thing we haven't talked about yet is Venus return. And I kind of left something easier for the end. Maybe I felt bad because, you know, the renin angiotensin mechanism and then capillary exchange and hydrostatic versus osmotic pressure. That's kind of hard. But let's talk about Venus return. So blood that leaves the heart does so through arteries. Blood's traveling in this direction. And the blood moving through arteries can move quickly because it has the benefit of the pump right behind it. But venous blood doesn't have the benefit of a pump. You don't have another pump in your toe to help push blood back up. So how on earth do we push this venous blood back up, oftentimes against gravity? Think about the veins in your legs. They've got to pump blood against gravity. Well, these are all ways in which we can do that. And we're going to talk about each one. But what we rely on most is the skeletal muscle pump. So we're going to talk about all of them. And I'd like you to know that they all exist. But what we end up relying on most is the skeletal muscle pump. So we have a bit of a pressure gradient. So as it turns out, the pressure that blood leaves the heart with, you know, goes all the way to our capillaries and then leads into our veins, which goes back up. There is still a bit of a pressure gradient. It may only be 7 to 13 millimeters of mercury. I'm not going to ask you that number, but... Even though we've lost so much pressure by the time we get to the capillaries, the heart pumps so forcefully that there's still a little bit of pressure. So there's a little gradient where the pressure here is higher than the pressure here. But it's not a big gradient, and that alone would not be enough. We use veins or valves. You know, veins have a valve and that prevents backflow. So whenever blood starts to move up a little bit, but then maybe it comes down a little bit, there's a valve there to prevent backflow. That would be bad. So any progress that we make, we're not going to lose too much of it because these valves prevent backflow. Now, it's an important point. The valves are not mechanical forces that push blood up. Rather, they just prevent backflow. Now, in some instances, we can rely on gravity. Think about the veins coming from your head, right? They can rely on gravity to help bring blood flow back down. In the thorax, simply because when we breathe in and out, we're changing the volume of our thoracic cage, and by doing so, we increase and then decrease the pressure, That can help push some venous blood from the chest area back up towards the heart. But all of those together would not be enough alone. So we really rely on the skeletal muscle pump. And this just means that because veins travel between skeletal muscles, when we contract those skeletal muscles, it squeezes the blood up. And then when we relax the skeletal muscles, some of that venous blood will come back down, but because the valve closes, it'll prevent backflow. So simply by contracting and relaxing our muscles, we, it has the effect of pumping venous blood back up, but very slowly. This is why if someone is not mobile, if they are... Um, post-surgery, it's very important that they contract muscles still. Um, you know, even someone that had ACL reconstructive surgery, they're still going to be, the, that night or the next morning, they're still going to be doing some isometric exercises where they just contract their quads and relax, contract the quads and relax, not even moving their knee. But the importance of contracting these skeletal muscles to help our venous blood flow. Um, 
people that are on a plane. This is why it's important, especially if you just had surgery or someone who's carrying a lot of extra weight. It's really important that they get up and walk around to activate the skeletal muscle pump and prevent blood from pooling. If you just had surgery, you're going to have more inflammation and possibly more fluid that could collect. If someone's carrying a lot of extra weight, they've just got more vessels and more fluid to try and push already. And then when you add upon that, the pressurized cabin and not moving, it could be very dangerous. All right. Um, Don't worry about this. This is all extra. I get a little carried away. Um, The last thing I'm going to ask you to know is um, shock. So maybe you've heard of shock. Well, the type that I'm going to talk about right now is hypovolemic shock. And this is a shock. I mean, shock is when your body basically begins to shut down because of a severe life-threatening situation, severe blood loss, severe diabetic coma, right? Well, you, you could get into a situation of shock because of a drastic lack of, lack of blood flow. Hence the name hypo, less than, and volemic, volume. So if we have severe blood loss, it could lead to a type of shock called, as hypo, called hypovolemic shock. All right, folks, good work. Study hard. Ask me if you have questions.